Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, July 24th, 2014. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, we visit with Vaughn Stewart, brewing manager of Arcadia Brewing Company of Kalamazoo, Michigan, where they brew English-style ales using open fermentation and extensive repitching of yeast from batch to batch. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can follow my rants on Twitter. Basic Brewing is where you'll find me, all one word. Also, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And our show page on Facebook is at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on the Google Plus, too. And uh, thanks to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our BasicBrewing.com site. You know how it works, apparently. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, go to BasicBrewing.com first and click on our link. That will take you to uh, Amazon where you can shop to your heart's content. You won't pay any extra, but you'll be helping to support this show. and greatly, greatly appreciate your help. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine in the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. Our basic brewing iPhone app is on iTunes. Our Android app is on Amazon.com. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory. We're on the, we have a Windows app, too, I think. We're just everywhere. Click on our brewer's logbook at basicbrewingshop.com. In the front is a blank calendar that you can use to track your fermentations and plan your brews. And since the calendar is blank, you can buy it even in, at the end of July here, and you'll still get 12 months of a brewing calendar. And the good news is, or better news even, is that there's room in the back of the book to log the details of up to 50 batches of brew. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. And thanks to everybody who's done so already. Protect your precious beer with one of our growler bags. Check those out at basicbrewingshop.com. And uh, for a limited time, you can get a free basic brewing bottle opener with the purchase of any of our DVD combos. And that bottle opener is a cool thing. I uh, posted a new episode of Basic Brewing Video on Monday, as I promised you in last week's episode. In that episode, we took a tour of Pilot Malt House with the owner and founder, Eric May. And uh, this is a fun episode to shoot because, you know, when I think of malting, I think of stainless steel tanks and high-tech gear or, you know, floor malting where it's all on the floor and... and uh, I, you know, it seems it seems like it's uh, it's a fairly elaborate uh, process. Well, at, at Pilot Malt House, they've decided to take a fairly low tech approach uh, as an entry point to get into craft malting, and they essentially just use simple tubs, these big tubs, to soak and germinate uh, the grain, and then once it's done uh, sprouting to the point where they want, uh, they kiln it in a device that they fabricated themselves. Um, and we show you that on the podcast. It's an approach that um, I'm sure that they'll grow out of uh, before too long. Um, but it reminds me of when we first visited Dry Dock Brewing Company in Aurora, Colorado, way back in the day. Back then, Kevin DeLang was uh, brewing on a very small system that was pretty low tech. Uh, but from that seed, Dry Dock Brewing has grown exponentially. And uh, I hope that that's the, the same story for Eric and Pilot Malthouse. It's very, very cool. Enjoyed that uh, visit with Eric. It's um, it, it's really fun to hear of uh, small malting companies popping up around the country, just as there are small brewery uh, breweries popping up. So who knows what the next level of uh, this whole phenomenon will be. Let's take a quick look into the mailbag before we move on. Don from Clearwater, Florida, writes about another Basic Brewing Video episode. Don says, I have a question about the quantity of water used in the February 28, 2014 episode titled Speedy Homebrewing. I would like to try the recipe, and when Steve was brewing, he mentioned starting with three quarts of water, and it doesn't appear that he topped off before pitching the yeast. Since three quarts is one quart short of a gallon, should he have topped off or no? I don't want to short myself on such a small batch, so I figured I would ask. Now, for that batch of beer... We were using a one-gallon fermenter, one-gallon jug, and I wanted to leave room for fermentation, so the target volume was three quarts to have plenty of room. And that'll get you a six-pack of beer or so. 
But if you're if your target starting volume for fermentation is three quarts, why start off with three quarts of water at the start of the boil? Well, first of all, the boil is only 15 minutes, so you're not going to lose a bunch of volume to steam. And second, you have to remember that a pound of light dry malt extract, which is what we used for the recipe, takes up space too. I'd say that uh, it's probably about a quart's worth of space, maybe. Uh, forgive the non-metric measurements. Um, so at the end of the process at the end of the short boil, we wound up with about three quarts going into the fermenter. And tr truth be told, there was plenty of room for fermentation in that uh, one gallon jug, and we could have topped up a bit more or uh, added a bit more water, you know, at the start of the process before the boil, because the fermentation had plenty of room in that jug. But, uh, you know, that's, that's up to you. Hope that that answers the question. Now let's move on to the meat of the matter. Uh, the interview you're about to hear was recorded after we recorded our show with David Curtis at Bells in Kalamazoo on David's um, hop bitterness experiment, or different uh, uh, hopping methods, hopping techniques experiment. And uh, David was kind enough to take Steve, Andy, and me around uh, Kalamazoo a bit while we're in town to show us around. And one of the stops was at Arcadia Brewing Company. It's a beautiful new place, and the smells of awesome barbecue uh, were wafting through the air when we walked in, um, and we got a flight of beers to taste and share. We shared the flight because, you know, we're, uh, it, it was it a was fairly, uh, fairly long day, um, and in a bit as we were sharing and talking there, uh, Vaughn Stewart joined us at the table. And uh, we talked for a while about each of the beers, and then as he started talking about the brewing process that Arcadia uses, I had to go and get the microphone because I think that this stuff is is pretty darn cool. Using open day or open fermentation, first of all, and then uh, reusing and repitching the yeast from batch to batch to batch to batch as they do, uh, I thought that that was incredibly fascinating stuff. Uh, the interview takes place in the production brewery, which is uh, busy and a little no noisy, but uh, no worries there. Uh, and to pick on myself, <laughs> in, the interview, in the interview, if you pay attention, Vaughn says that they have repitched this single yeast strain about 825 times. And right after that, I immediately interpreted or interpolated that to be 850. So... <laughs> <laughs> I must have been thinking of another of the next question as uh, Vaughn was talking about the anyway. Uh, so Vaughn and Steve were were kind enough not to uh, correct me there. Anyway, if you like the geeky technical side of brewing and playing with yeast, you're going to love this one. So uh, my name is Vaughn Stewart, and I am the brewing manager at Arcadia Brewing Company. And we're in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yep. So we're, we're in our Kalamazoo facility, uh, which is pretty new. Um, it's been, we've been open to the public for about a month and a half as of mid-June. Um, and we've been in Battle Creek, Michigan, which is just 30 minutes east of here, for uh, 18 years. Huh? So, yeah, since 1996. And what's the, well, tell us about, tell us about your background, first of all. Okay. So I started uh, in the homebrewing industry. Um, I started as uh, just a retail associate at Northern Brewer in Milwaukee. I did that for about two years, and then I moved into uh, management with Northern Brewer at the Minneapolis store. Um, helped open the Minneapolis store, did that for about eight months or so, and then moved into uh, marketing with Northern Brewer in Roseville, Minnesota, and I did that for about two years. And then after that, I came here. Uh, this was about a year ago, June of 2013, and uh, just recently I was put into this position that I'm in now as brewing manager. So, wow, yeah. So your your homebrew setup is quite a bit larger here. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, this is a this is a 50 barrel W M Sprinkman uh, brew house. Uh, it's made in Wisconsin, um, and it's uh, it's essentially. A five vessel brew house, three primary vessels. We basically, we've got a mash louder ton, or a boil kettle with an external work boiler, external calandria, um, and we've got a whirlpool. Those are the three main vessels. 
We have a hot liquor tank and a cold liquor tank. And wow. So that's that's kind of the basic structure. Now, you guys, uh, we were talking, sam- sampling beers and talking in the other room, and it's not so much on the hot side that that distinguishes Arcadia from, from other breweries, right? Right. That's correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of our... What makes us unique is in uh, is in fermentation. Um, everything at Arcadia is fermented open, so there's our fermenters are basically large stainless steel buckets with no lids on them. Um, and the initial system was was it was originally a what is called a Peter Austin brew house. The biggest example of that is the Shipyard Brewing Company in Portland, Maine, um, but. It's basically an old English style of making beer where you've just got big open tanks and uh, everything's done by hand and it's a very hands-on, you know, no automation, no frills way of brewing. Kind of the same way it's been done since the 1860s or so. So, Now, now do you know why that decision was made to begin with? I mean, that seems to be a philosophical decision that has Mm -hmm. to be made at the beginning of the operation. Yeah, I think it it really was... um, a lot of it was just a, a decision that that our owners, you know, decided that English style ales, you know, uh, beers of of tradition, of you know, bitters and ESBs and porters and IPAs, all those kind of classic English style ales. And the Peter Austin design was specifically uh, a brew house kind of method or, or theory of design that embraced. Uh, uh, simple operations done, you know, by hand with hard work, um, with you know, minimal uh, kind of breakable parts. It's you know, reliable, rugged workhouse kind of kind of breweries. So, that, and that I think is was just the it resonated strongly with the southwestern Michigan um, identity. You know, uh, Battle Creek especially being a cereal town. It's it's manufacturing. It's you know we make furniture in southwestern Michigan. We make cereal. We make things, mm. and so it, it goes kind of hand in hand having that that manual touch uh, to to the traditional English ales. But Vaughn, you, we know from home brewing that you you have to have a cover on your fermenter and you have to have an airlock yeah. with the liquid in there so that you don't get an infection from your. Don't don't you guys know that? Uh, yeah yeah I mean you know that's that's. Uh, that's definitely true. It's always a good idea to uh, to be safe, um, and you know, modern brewing science has given us a lot of, of progress since the days of open fermentation, which is how beer was always kind of traditionally made. Um, but with open fermentation, you know, w- basically it, it works by a couple of things. It works by the fact that our yeast strain forms a thick Krausen on the top of the beer, even if the beer is at 38 degrees Fahrenheit, even after that yeast has been pulled down out of solution, um, you've still got a very stubborn, thick head of Krausen protecting the beer from anything outside. Um, you know, additionally, with an open top fermenter, you've always got pretty much CO2 evolving out, and CO2 is toxic to pretty much everything, so that's also going to push everything away. Um, and finally, we just are still really careful about sanitation. You know, it's still just as important. It's not like we're skipping anything. You know, we're still stringent about before you get anywhere close to the yeast or the beer, you need to sanitize your arms, your hands. You need to wear hairnets, protection, everything. You know, there, there needs to be a barrier between you and that precious liquid. So what yeast strain are we talking about? Yeah, so our, our yeast strain uh, was originally a Ringwood strain. Ringwood was the brewery that Peter Austin started in the 1980s. Uh, that kind of or 70s 80s that uh, helped to kickstart the craft brewing scene in England, um, and uh, so the Ringwood strain, um, it's kind of a like a Midlands strain is what it's known as. So like the West Midlands, uh, West Yorkshire, Sam Smith, um, the Black Sheep Brewery, um, these breweries that make these traditional ales with open fermenters, they're all known for their strong chain forming tendencies. Um, and that chain forming tendency is what gives you that real thick Krausen on the top of the beer. Um, but basically, Ringwood, yeah, Ringwood 
so it started as Ringwood, and then we've we've kept it alive over the years. Um, right now, we're on uh, about generation number eight hundred and twenty-five. <laughs> um, and so that's uh, that's yeast that we've pulled off of the top of the fermenter and repitched into each subsequent batch. So we, we're pitching that yeast. You know, we pull a couple batches worth of yeast from one batch of beer so that we can keep everything alive and keep keep uh, keep brewing basically it, it relies on just brewing all the time so have you have you seen there's so many questions yeah. so have you <laughs> Sorry if Eight, no 850 and Steve Wilkes has joined us if you want to pop in a question but 850 generations uh, you know we have uh, in the in the home brewing world you know, we hear about people pitching on top of yeast cake and, you know, how many generations can you do that? And, and, and I have, my personally myself, through various ways of yeast collection and yeast repitching and, and things, you know, I've gotten, line, I've gotten like six or eight generations on, you know, like a USO5 yeast or something like that. Um, have, help us wrap our minds around that. I mean, how can you do 850 generations of, of yeast without starting all over again? Um, that's a good question. And to be honest, um, the, the simplest answer is that we just can. Um, <laughs> that's cheating. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, we, we, I mean, we, we look at our cells every time we harvest, um, we look at the cells under the microscope and make sure they're looking healthy. Um, one thing we also do is we only harvest within a given gravity window, within a given percentage of attenuation. Um, and what that does is that makes sure that, so when you've got fermentation, right, in an open vessel, the first time you're going to get um, a big buildup of hop uh, material, of trube, of all sorts of unpleasant substances, that's what's going to come up first. And it's going to come to kind of die down. And then it's going to come up again. And at that point, that's where the yeast has grown and is just attenuating, just ripping through wort, making alcohol, you know, being healthy. After um, more attenuation is completed, then some of the yeast is going to fall out. It's going to flocculate out of suspension. But you're going to get a really nice attenuative yet flocculent strain that rises to the top. And that's the time when we harvest. So that's the way that we keep it going, really, is we target the cells that are both attenuative and flocculent. Huh. Because if you harvest at the wrong time, you can either get a strain you know, or a cell that's, that's too attenuative, and it'll make the beer too dry, um, and most likely with that, you'll get a cell that's not flocculent. It's going to make the beer hazy. Mm. It's not going to fall out and stop you know, and, and leave the right balance of sugar and alcohol. Um, so that's... that's that, it's kind of a backwards way of answering the question, but that's that's kind of the way that we manage our um, doing so many generations. And, and then the other thing is just really, you know, basic sanitation. Um, everything gets uh, uh, gets cleaned thoroughly, sanitized thoroughly. Arms and hands, you know, from harvesting get sanitized. So no, it's a perfect it's a perfect day. Yeah, I think it breaks perfect sense. If you want, if you want to collect a yeast that has certain behaviors if you collect that yeast at, at that particular time during the cycle each time right it seems like you would reinforce that behavior in the next in the next generation exactly yeah and uh, you know uh, some biologists refer to that as i believe uh, selective pressure mm -hmm. so yeah. it's yeah. it's it's just what it sounds like it's being selective for the traits that you want and and not getting the traits that you don't want it's kind of similar to the debates I see on the brewing boards and things of when do you collect yeast for repitching? Mm -hmm. Do you collect it in the primary fermenter or you do you collect it in the secondary fermenter? Right. You know, it's the, diff the, di the cells, the individual cells that either settle out or come to the top, in your case, uh, are exhibiting a certain behavior uh, at that point in time. And if you collect those cells, you are then encouraging the next generation that comes from those cells to right. exhibit that behavior. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, uh, it's top cropping as a practice is really different from how a lot of 
breweries harvest their yeast uh, through, which is usually done through a, like a cylindric conical vessel with a cone. Sure. And you, you know, you dump a certain amount and you pull a certain amount and you do it kind of based on how the yeast looks. And that's a really effective technique. Um, there, there are still pressures put on those yeast cells that you collect. Um, the yeast cells are usually a little, a little hungrier. They're a little less um, uh, viable, a little less ready to do work. Um, whereas when we collect from the top, we're collecting yeast that is healthy and that is ready to keep working. And the way that we get it to stop working is, you know, we'll collect it, we'll put it in a vessel, or we'll just put it in refrigeration. Uh, we'll put it at 36, 38 degrees. So and that's to, enough yeah. to tell it to just, you know, settle out. Go and, to sleep. Yeah, go to sleep, but not, it doesn't lose viability. It doesn't lose any interest in fermenting. And you would think that, that yeast collected off the bottom of the of the cone will be under a lot of if you're if you've got a huge fermenter it's under a lot of physical pressure exactly that's exactly right there's also issues with yeah uh it's uh, osmotic stress or pressure things like that just the uh basic kind of physics tells us that a column of water a certain height has a certain amount of pressure right and that pressure is you know crushing down on those tiny little cell membranes so when you don't have pressure when you've got, you know, gas actually lift, literally lifting cells up and helping them stick up. Um, it's the opposite of pressure. It's, mm. you know, it's, they're, they're going up where they want to be. They're being healthy. So, so how do you, so we now, now we know the theory, right? What's the practice? How do you physically collect that yeast? Sure. Um, so for, for a long time, what we've done in, in Battle Creek and to an extent what we do here is, um, we walk up on a ladder, um, we put a sanitized, um, it's basically a trash can, but it's not, <laughs> never been used for trash. You know, it's a clean plastic vessel. We'll it, is a, it is a uh, cylindrical plastic container. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we have a sanitary container, and we have a sanitary um, bus tub on a stick, and... <laughs> Did you, I got one of those in the 70s, and then you use a bus tub on a stick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're talking about a literal plastic a tub yep. on a stick. Yep. It's a, it's a big scoop, big uh, you know, spoon or whatever. And it, you, 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 know, you dip it into the, the surface of the yeast and you know, avoid, try to avoid collecting beer and instead collect yeast itself, mm-hmm. collect the, the slurry. But uh, you uh, scoop it up and then put it into the vessel and then do that until you've got a certain weight. We shoot for about 20 to 25 kilos of yeast um, per vessel. And then, based on our brewing schedule and our brewing needs, we'll harvest a certain amount, certain number of, uh, we refer to them as brinks, of containers of yeast. And then, that's pretty much it. You just scoop it and put it in refrigeration and store it until it's needed, usually no more than 72 hours. I was going to say, can you, is there an advantage to refrigerating it before you repitch, or can you just repitch? Um, no, yeah, we, we definitely, whether intentionally or not, you know, sometimes the, the brew day and the cellar would get really tight, and you need yeast a couple minutes before it needs to be pitched. Hmm. So we'll definitely, we'll harvest and then just pitch it right away. That's not a problem. Um, but yeah, if it's going to be stored for more than say, I don't know, four to six hours, we'll put it under refrigeration. Mm. More than honestly, a lot of times, more, a lot of times more than anything, it's um, to make sure that it doesn't continue to ferment and push out of the vessel. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Do you yeah. need to feed it in any way if you if you keep it for an extended period of time? You probably would, but we we de- generally don't. Um, we we really try not to pitch anything that's older than about 60 to 72 hours hmm. um will you know we'll really prefer to to dump that yeast rather than use it uh. um it, it, what comes into play there too though is that we have a number of beers that we call harvest beers that we harvest yeast from and then we have some beers that generally are higher alcohol beers uh. that we just don't harvest yeast from no, because it puts more stress on the uh, yeast and it's good not point. as healthy that's a good point so so is that good advice for home brewers i mean how how long, you know, if I harvest some yeast and stick it in my fridge, mm-hmm. I'm looking at about three days before I really need to use it or, or lose it? Yeah, I mean, 
So it gets complicated is the, the short answer. And I'm not, I'm not entirely up on, on yeast biology as, as I have been in the past, but um, my understanding is that the longer you store it, you can certainly store it longer and use it, but what's going to happen is its viability is going to decrease. So as you keep it longer, um, you're still going to get fermentation, but you might start to consider just waking it back up with a small volume of fresh wort akin to a starter or something like that. Andy, you're free to join the conversation. Andy's looking around. He's drooling over all the gear. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was actually hanging out with the guy that uh, built all this stuff. The guy from <laughs> Sparkman. The guy that uh, did this. Sparkman. Very, yeah, very, yeah. very cool. Yeah. So when do you have one of these in your house? I'm going to get a much smaller one. <laughs> um, I put a deposit in. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's an expensive trip for Andy. So, so we're talking about this. I mean, so obviously you guys use one yeast. Yes. But you've got a, the list of beers on your beer list is as long as my arm. You've got sure. a, you've got a lot of beers. Yep. What? And and it's not like we're drinking the same beer over and over and over again. Right. Um. How, what is the approach or what is the philosophy to keeping a divergent? You know, a variety of beers on the list using that same yeast. Yeah, um, I think um, honestly, a lot of times you can you can get a lot of variety just through either brew house technique, recipe design, uh, water modification. Um, we do a number of beers that are aged in barrels, aged in oak barrels. You know, that's going to change the character of the beer, obviously. Um, in the summertime coming up, we do a, a rye beer made with fruit, made with blueberries, Michigan blueberries. Um, so those are kind of easy ways to, to screw with the profile. But um, I think a lot of times, you know, we get, with our higher gravity beers, we get a different flavor because we're pitching really a similar quantity of yeast as our harvest beers. So it's getting just a tiny bit more stress, and it's producing just a tiny bit more ester character. So you can, st you can I really think, I think um, a lot of ways that we get variety is through our, our pitching rate and through um, not stressing the yeast, but just, just um, I don't know, uh, using it in a different medium, mm -hmm. I guess, if that makes sense. Do you vary fermentation temperatures as well? Nope. Oh. No. Everything, uh, everything... Our target is to, to uh, put cast out wort in the fermenter at 67 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we set our temp controllers to 69 degrees Fahrenheit mm. and hold them there generally for uh, about two to three days. We actually do temperature control based on um, uh, degree of attenuation or, or where kind of in the degrees Plato, mm. uh, how much sugar is left, you know, something like that. And so sometimes we'll do a bump to... 70 degrees after a certain period of time, bump to 71. 72 is the highest we'll go. And pretty much we try to get every beer to at least hit 72 before the end of fermentation. That's going to help make sure to reduce uh, diacetyl levels um, and, you know, just off gas any volatiles or things that we don't want in, excuse me, in the beer. And is, is, the, is that diacetyl rest, is that a a characteristic, or is that is that a companion of this particular yeast strain? Yeah, very much so. I mean, Ringwood, Ringwood as a strain, uh, originally it's it's very much associated with high diacetyl production. Um, many English strains produce a healthy amount of diacetyl. Um, Ringwood's especially well known for it, but we shoot for a fairly low level of diacetyl in in all of our beers. Um, not that it's it's a bad thing in theory, just that as an American-style brewery with English roots, it's kind of the best of both worlds where a little bit of diacetyl is possible, but it's really to let that really, you know, the, the substantial hop character of most of our beers shine. Mm -hmm. um, getting a little bit of diacetyl out of there is, is better. Yeah, I think, uh, how, many, how, many, how many beers did I sample? I think I sampled 10 beers in flights. 
and I think I picked on only one of them. Yeah. <laughs> and that was just a little bit. I, I'm very sensitive, apparently, to, to diacetyl, and, and uh, there was just a little bit of, of buttery character to one of the beers, but the, that was the only... The, the other beers were extremely clear, or extremely clean, didn't you guys think? Oh, yeah, they were very clean. And I wouldn't have picked up on the uh, buttery quality had you not mentioned it. <laughs> I spoiled it for everybody. It's a California Chardonnay of beers. <laughs> And the, and the hops really shine through on the hoppy beers. That's for sure. All the beers here are really outstanding. And uh, the ESB, I think, is the one you were talking about. And I thought it just added a nice roundness to the flavor of the beer. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. that's what I thought, too. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think it was distracting. Uh, I picked it up, but, but I, I didn't think it was... It was complimentary, let's just say. Right, right. Uh, and it's not necessarily... And you were saying that it's not necessarily a... a an ongoing feature of that style. Yeah, I mean, it, um, w- what we do for diacetyl basically is at the end of fermentation, when we're satisfied that the beer has achieved a stable terminal gravity, gravity, um, we'll do a, like a, a sensory diacetyl check. Um, so we take a sample of beer and we heat it up in a hot water bath. Um, it's 60 C for 60 minutes. And then, you know, cool it back down to serving temperature and taste it against the control of just beer straight from the fermenter. And if, you know, if you taste diacetyl in the control beer, then that's obviously straight away. It needs more time to eliminate that diacetyl. If you taste diacetyl in the heated beer, then there's a chance that there's still some diacetyl precursor and it still needs more time. So either of those situations, if diacetyl is detected... And we have to have a consensus between uh, multiple brewers. Um, then you know we'll give it an extra day usually in the fermenter, and and that almost always clears up any you know diacetyl. But but yeah, I mean sometimes um, sometimes a little bit makes it through, and you know for the most part I think we don't we don't worry about it. Um, we might blend a couple of batches together if it's verging on problematic but i don't think that's ever happened in no, the time and not, i've been here and not not meaning to pick on you <laughs> <laughs> i'm just being a beer jerk no, but <laughs> oh, get a bit of, a little bit of butter in this one yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you said also uh in the tasting room you were talking about um the yeast performs differently in different seasons as well yeah it's i mean it's kind of a. It might be more of a brewer's superstition. We don't actually know that it. The you know by the. We know that the by full the numbers, moon comes out. Yeah, <laughs> by the numbers sometimes there's one or two degrees Plato difference um, in some seasons versus others, and you know whether that's really seasonal or whether it's just because we have there are so many variables to how we harvest yeast and how we brew beer and they all conspire to happen and change something all at once you know it's hard to say um but uh but it is interesting that the yeast sometimes you know for as much as we try to be very scientific and very um methodical and practical in how we make beer um sometimes you know we just look at the yeast on the surface of the beer and we say maybe it's not ready to harvest yet, uh-huh. even though the numbers are telling us so. Or, you know, those... And those are kind of just experience-based um, understandings of having been here and worked with this one yeast strain and worked with this, you know, these ranges of beers. and It's just a... It's kind of a brewer's art or brewer's superstition, so... Well, you get to, you're you are yeast ranchers, I think, right. as John Palmer put it in in, in How to Brew, and uh, you are you get to know your animals. Exactly. That's yeah. That's that's pretty much exactly right. It's we just we understand our yeast and we understand our processes and and um, yeah, that's you put it perfectly. We get to know our animals. <laughs> have 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 there been any tests? to compare the original yeast that all this came from with what you have now as your house yeast strain? Um, I, I'm pretty sure there have been. I'm not intimately familiar with any, any details there. 
but you know if you look at the other really big um, Ringwood Brewery that's in the U.S. is the Shipyard Brewing Company in Portland, Maine. So even if you you know you look at their IPA versus our IPA, I'm sure you could find differences in yeast character there. I'm sure that their yeast, you know, they I think they mainly use a 50 barrel system, so I'm sure that their fermenter geometry is different, and just those subtle differences over time of the way you culture the yeast and the way you treat it, you know, changes things. Um, but uh, it's it's definitely it's it's infinitely fascinating, you know, to, oh, yeah. to uh, work with this one yeast strain and really kind of get it get it dialed in. So. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, we we weren't expecting to hear to stumble onto the story. I mean, David brought us over here from from Bell's, uh, and we're enjoying the beers. And you you came came down and, and sat with us and was like, I got to get the microphone because this is this is an awesome story. Yeah, uh, not only the open fermenters where you know you guys must be doing must be doing an awesome job of sanitization uh, to keep the beer as clean uh, but also the yeast is healthy and it's doing the job of kicking the invaders out probably right, right. Um, but but then the fact that you're just reusing the same stuff over and over and over again yeah. you know just like they used to do I'm assuming yeah it's, it's just it's just a wonderful story and you know to top it all off you know we tasted 10 beers and we got we we thought there were ten good beers, yeah. so there are more beers out there, which you know we may or may not avail ourselves to. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is the first day of a long week. Sure. But <laughs> but man, what a fun what a fun story! Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I mean, it's it's um, it's just the kind of the way we've been making beer. You know, it's the way we do things, and I think that um, you know. Open fermentation, you can do it at home. Mm. You know, I've I've done it as a home brewer. It's it, you can even cheat and just have kind of like a lid half on or something like that. <laughs> or, or I've seen cheat, you know, cheesecloth over the surface. That's fine. It's still open fermentation. Um, but yeah, we've been really fortunate and and more than fortunate. I mean, we have really talented brewers. You know, and we have really talented people that we work with, and and that just makes all the difference. We have a great beer community in Michigan. Um, you know, and we're in a number of states that also support us really well. So, um, yeah, things are in in summation, I guess things are good at Arcadia. And well, one advantage that y'all have on a on a light note is you don't have dog hair floating through the room. I don't. Th- I've not, sure. not seen a clump of dog hair floating through this room. It's that a was, bit different than the home brewery. In that, way. <laughs> that was exactly the yeah. thought I had because in my home brewery, there's a Shih Tzu running around, <laughs> and it's like, oh no, I'm not putting dog hair in my open fermentation, you know. So, right. yeah, you definitely have the advantage. Yeah. Vaughn, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you taking the time. Cheers, yeah, cheers. Thanks for coming down, you guys. Really appreciate you know seeing all of you and meeting you. So, been a big fan for a while. So. Thanks again to Vaughn for the time and the hospitality showing us around. And uh, after we finished recording, Vaughn took us around and, and showed us, like, the canning line and things like that. And then uh, Vaughn and I went up on a scissor lift, about I swear it was 25 feet in the air, to look into the open fermenters uh, to see how that how the yeast was, was uh, looking. And uh, I'm glad I had a beer or two for the... <laughs> You know, because you get up 25 feet on a uh, scissor lift, and you, you you turn around, and, and the thing goes wong, wong, and wiggles around a little bit. And for me, that kind of thing takes a little uh, liquid courage. Uh, I, I have a very healthy respect for the combination of height and gravity. Uh, but the, I, they're very safe, don't get me wrong. Uh, I didn't feel like I was unsafe at any point, but, you know, anytime my head is that far above... Uh, concrete floor i get i get a little hinky as they say more great stuff from michigan uh coming next week and the weeks after that if you until then if you have brewing questions show suggestions or just want to say howdy write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com and please don't forget to tell us where you're from you'll find our bottle openers on our shop our basic brewing growler bags uh you can find our support link 
where you can throw us a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcast. And you can do a one-time donation as well if you scroll down a little bit. Be sure to check out our DVDs. Uh, extract brewing and partial mashing, stepping into all grain, low-tech lagering and decoction mashing, and introduction to wine kits. You can find them all on our site, along with combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And... Right now, if you buy a DVD combo, any of the DVD combos, you get a free cool bottle opener. And this is a really cool thing. If you haven't seen this thing, it's like this plastic cylinder. It's got two pieces in it. And all you have to do is put it over the, the top of the bottle and ka the, the bottle cap comes off. And if you collect bottle caps, this is the thing for you because it does very little damage to the, uh, the caps when it takes them off, or at least in my experience. So anyway, there's there's the pitch for that. <laughs> Our brewer's logbooks are in the store, too. Keep track of up to 50 batches of beer. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are... How to Play Fingerstyle Blues Guitar Solos. And Coleman High Pressure Propane Hose and Adapter. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site. The next time you feel like Amazon shopping, we greatly appreciate your support. Bobby, don't forget you can also join the American... I wonder what the percentage of people will make it this far in the podcast without clicking next. Uh, you can subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine or, and or join the American Homebrewers Association through our associate links as well. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Bobby Do- or Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.